What does the smallest lens Nikon currently makes and one of the most expensive TV series ever produced have in common? They both strived for perfection, but both fell short. Only after embracing their flaws can we see something special. Hello, I'm Jack, scientist, street photographer, and this is Bokeh Therapy. To help practice my pronunciation ahead of my next Japan trip, I've been binge watching Shogun, despite the director's commitment to authenticity. The show doesn't look like your average period drama. They use distinctively flawed lenses lenses to create an imperfect unreality. And this tiny lens is not perfect either. It's the smallest first party Nikon lens you can buy right now. But to make it this small, they had to make compromises. After shooting with it for a month, I found five quirks, each of which might be a deal breaker for some. So why did I pay full price and add it to my everyday carry? Turns out this is one of Nikon's most underrated gems. And just like Shogun, it's full of wabi-sabi. Quirk 5. Distortion. Shogun went out of its way to get the look and feel of feudal Japan right, even hiring not one, not two, but three masters of gestures to teach the younger Japanese actors how to walk in historically accurate ways. But it's the same production team that chose not to comply with one of the most basic rules in visual hierarchy, straight lines. Architecture to door frames, the edges always looked unnaturally curved. I love the anamorphic look as much as the next film school dropout, but of all the lenses they had at their disposal, what did they choose anamorphics that had this much distortion for a period piece drama. Distortion is also an issue for this Nikon 26mm, but you almost never see it. It's corrected through software, both in camera and automatically in Lightroom, so I was impressed with how straight the edges looked through the EVF. When distortion actually appears, it's the inescapable perspective distortion. 26mm is not ultra wide, but it's wide enough to cause this effect if your lens isn't level or you're too close to the subject. But Shogun and this lens taught me how to work with the distortion rather than around it. Using it as a storytelling device to exaggerate geometry, to make a space feel bigger, or to extend the leading line for a feeling of grandeur. Grandeur might be the last word used to describe John Blackthorne's rude introduction to the East. The distortion here acts as a visual proxy for how otherworldly Japan's traditions must feel to the Anjin from the West. Honor-bound traditions are a double-edged sword, and all the good we experience as voyeuristic tourists, the cuisine, courtesy, the cleanliness, it all comes at the cost of strict hierarchy. I've been to Japan once a year for the past 15 years. I think I know the etiquette and customs well enough, but am I helping or hurting their over-tourism problem? Another gaijin lost in the big city. It can be easy to feel small. Quirk 4 size. Size is the main draw of this lens, only 125 grams, but to make it this small, Nikon had to make compromises. The lens extends beyond the lens barrel, moving in and out when focusing, which makes me a bit nervous if the camera accidentally turns on in the bag. But there's a reason Nikon designed it like this, we'll come back to this later, and thankfully, the included lens hood protects all those lens elements moving in and out. With a 52mm filter on the front, a metal mount, and rubber gasket on the back, I feel really confident in the weather ceiling. There are other trade-offs due to the size. There's no switches or custom buttons. The control ring is easier to bump, but the thing you'll notice the most is how much the frame changes when you're focusing up close. The focus breathing is pretty bad. Even though the minimum focusing distance is 0.2 meters, really close, you might not want to actually shoot that close. But Shogun leaned into the focus breathing. The focus racking between characters looks jarring. Visual punctuation before the next piece of exposition. I have just over a month before my next Japan trip, but the main hurdle for me is kanji. Beautiful tiny pictograms without a hint of phonetic pronunciation amidst their brushstrokes. Japanese children are expected to know over a thousand kanji by the end of grade school. So what hope does the average tourist have? Quirk 3. Bokeh. Shogun's bokeh has that telltale oval-shaped bokeh of anamorphic lenses, which is different to the round or cat's eye shaped bokeh in our aspherical photography lenses. This is a look, a rather aggressive one at that. But it's not just the shape, it's also the swirl. When coupled with the distortion, it makes the whole frame look disorientating. Nikon's 26mm has surprisingly good bokeh for an f2.8 wide angle lens. When you get really close at 0.2 meters, at that distance everything in the background is blurred. Unlike Shogun's anamorphic swirl, the Nikon 26 only shows a little bubbling in the highlights, but otherwise the bokeh is smooth 
and pleasing. It didn't shop Shogun's cinematographers though, and they constantly shot wide open, faces in and out of focus amidst all that swirly oval anamorphic bokeh. This shows how isolating it can be even when you're bound by collective cultural identity. It's not just the Anjin who feels out of place. In the month I have left before the trip, I'm not going to obsess over kanji. Instead, I'm going to go back to basics with hiragana and katakana, about 90 commonly used phonetic characters that will let me sound out signs of the street or menus in izakayas. My five-year-old daughter is learning Japanese in school right now, and she memorized all these characters in about two weeks, so how hard can it be? Out come the flashcards, character on the front, pronunciation on the back, and hopefully my old dog brain can still learn this one new trick. What new trick does this 26mm lens add to my everyday carry? It comes down to quirk 2, sharpness. I own the Nikon 40mm f2 and just like the 28mm f2.8, it's not that much bigger than the pancake lens and it's less than half the price. So what do you get for those extra dollars on the 26mm? Nikon kept the 28 and 40mm small by compromising on aberrations. There's chromatic aberration and purple and green fringing in the brightest parts of those images, but they also compromised how sharp these lenses are up close. The 40mm is quite sharp from mid distances on, so it's great for street, but really falls apart up close. For this 26mm in the center, at any distance, including at minimum focus distance, I'm stunned at how sharp this lens is. Nikon somehow made the 26mm sharper and better control for aberrations while being smaller or lighter than the 28 and the 40. It's not perfect though, there's field curvature, it's not sharp corner to corner, and there's a heavy vignette even when you stop down to f5.6 or f8. But Shogun's cinematographers were okay with vignetting, maybe a little too okay with it. Half the shots simply have blacked out corners, almost like they use super 35 lenses on full frame sensors, but when the images come out this sharp and contrasty in the center of the 26 millimeter, great for kids, food, family shots, and tight spaces, I'm okay with this level of vignetting. How did Nikon make a lens this small, this sharp? There's nothing more isolating than being alone in the crowd. Depending on your perspective, John Blackthorne the Unjin is either the best or worst part of Shogun. But unlike the last samurai, this time the foreigner is not the main event. It's not just the Unjin scenes that are shot with anamorphic lenses. That distorted, vignetted, out of focus look is embedded across the series. It depicts a period of transition, an uncertain time for an uncertain place, and the wabi-sabi of the visual choices point towards the battle scars yet to come. How did Nikon make a lens this small, this sharp? That's due to the 26mm's all element focusing design. The reason the lens extends beyond the lens barrel to get a sharp image up close when every element moves in unison. Over time, even the barbarian realizes when not to stand out, and quirk one of this lens is the fact that it's loud. When you're autofocusing, you can hear the motors working away. 0.2 meters to infinity is quite a distance for all those elements to move at the same time. It sounds like it's grinding a little, not the case for the 40 millimeter or 28 millimeter. And coupled with the 26 millimeters focused breathing, it might be reason enough for videographers to choose the 28. This noise hasn't affected the autofocus speed or accuracy for me. So I think that part might be a little overblown. But if you need to get close to your subject, they will be able to hear it. It's ironic that the small size, which makes us more discreet, is also what makes the autofocus loud enough to stand out. For me, the background noise on the street drowns it away, especially when attached to my Nikon ZF. A tourist-friendly retro camera has just as much charm as this tiny 26mm pancake. I'm willing to trade these quirks for this lens's sharp results and wider field of view, perfect for family, street, and travel to Japan. I don't want to be part of the over-tourism problem, we need to be part of the solution. And I'm hoping this smaller footprint alongside my improved Japanese will make me stand out less in a crowd. I'm not there yet, the few broken phrases I know will be my version of Wabi Sabi. But like this lens, it should be okay to have our flaws on display. I'm still deciding what else to bring on the trip, but I've just added an astonishing behemoth to my kit. You'll find that video here when it's ready to go. I'm Jack, capturing peace in every moment.